Good evening, everybody out there. Okay, here we go. Good evening, you guys. I want you guys to turn to Daniel chapter 4 right away. Right away. Let's turn there. Well, the fever left early this morning. It left. Yesterday, it wasn't too bad. It was 102 degrees. But we made it through the broadcast. Everything is on the uh, up, so we're going to go. That's the injuries had to do with the uh, fever. I do suspect that. There is uh, another issue, but Orcus. Um, the Shaz, Shaz, the interpretation three one is the inside of it. Da remember Darius was bound by King Nebuchadnezzar was bound by, do you remember that? After Darius, of course, 10 other kings came. Xerxes and Artaxerxes and all these different Xerxes lineage came into power. They operated by the rule of law. The rule of law. They operated by the rule of law. That's when the rule of law was established. King Nebuchadnezzar, right? If he, if he made a law, he was bound by that law. Remember the spy tried to trick him. You remember that? Now, King Nebuchadnezzar put all this in place, but he was bound. He bound himself by the same law. He passed. The same thing we use today. Same thing. And it is, in fact, a Babylonian principle. It is, in fact. All right, let's continue to go. That's just one. There are so many things you may not know about. Welcome to the real world. And he says, And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. So we have Babylon, which God gave rule over all the earth. Then we have another kingdom that pops up, right, inferior to the first one. Then we have a third kingdom that pops up of brass that has rule over all the earth. Anybody know what that is? What, 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 what kingdom came up that had rule over all the earth besides Babylon? Which kingdom had rule over all the earth besides Babylon? Which one? Which one? Come on, help me. You're, uh, so back in the time, right? Back in the time of, of Revelation, you had some king, five fallen kingdoms, Egypt, uh, Neo-Assyria, Neo-Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. But Rome was still standing. Remember that? Rome was standing. And indeed, Rome had dominion over what? All the earth. Rome did. Now, remember, the Bible is also... Middle Eastern centuries. Uh, but let's continue. Let's continue. 30, um, 39. And after these shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh into pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break into pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part potter's clay, part iron, the kingdom shall be divided. We're talking about the fourth kingdom. But there shall be in it the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the, sawest the iron mixed with the miry clay. And as the toes and of the feet were part iron and part clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Now, what did Jesus say? I go to prepare a place for you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. When did he say that? When did he say that? Right at the close, right that this was happening. He made that declaration. 
And then at the close of the Roman kingdom, it was, you know, it was all was happening. And then here we are right now. Here we are right now. Right now. Right. So we're talking about, a, this is a, this was prophesied long ago. Right. And he said, in the days of these kings of the fourth kingdom. Now, not the third. The third was what? What was the third kingdom? Anybody? The third kingdom was, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. He was talking about the kingdom of God because he said the kingdom of God is not coming with observation. No one's going to say, here it is, hello, there it is. The kingdom of God is born within you, right? He said, I go to set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. That's the kingdom of God, right? That's the final kingdom. So we have four kingdoms. Four. Four. But you got to see this. The first kingdom was Babylon. The head of gold. Remember? Babylon, the head of gold. There was a second kingdom inferior to that uh, head of gold, right? That would come. And that, that's Daniel 2.39. And where is, where is it at? Daniel 2.39, and after thee shall rise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Rome had rule over all the earth. Rome did. So Babylon did. Then there was another inferior kingdom. There was. And then Rome had rule over all the earth. In fact, this is where... I get thrown under the bus because I, I don't really match up with anybody else. But but listen, listen, I, I don't deduce things. I don't do that. I get pointed in certain directions. Not the whole thing, but pieces of it, right? So just bear with me. And then, of course, this fourth kingdom with all the iron mixed with miry clay, right? Which is stronger than all the other ones, but it's not quite the standard. It's partly broken, right? Partly strong and partly broken. That's, that's our kingdom because after this one, the kingdom of God comes in. Right? After this one, the kingdom of God comes in. So you're living in a kingdom right now that is not the Roman kingdom. You're living in a different kingdom, kingdom that was prophesied. See, because in this kingdom, right after the kingdom that bears rule over all the earth, the third kingdom right, of brass, the third kingdom of brass, which bears rule over all the earth, this is a fourth kingdom. A fourth king is going to be there. It's going to be as strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh into pieces and subdue all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break into pieces and bruise. And it did. These kingdoms today are unmovable. Because who's been able to break these kingdoms down? Hmm? They just get stronger and stronger and stronger. Don't they? Don't they? Hmm? Don't they? And it did subdue. It, it, has, it has, in fact, uprooted but it has jailed all the other kingdoms in this sense. It utilizes everything from all the other kingdoms. If you're in America right now, you're part of a Grecian, Roman, Egyptian philosophy. You may not even know it. That's stamped in the books. That's what they go by. That's what Congress is based on. That's what the White House and governments of the world right now are based on. Grecian Roman and Egyptian philosophers. That's where the Senate comes from, Rome, and all those places, and they got that from Babel. That's where they got it from. So when you start, when you when you start reading about that, or you get educated in that, you're going to see exactly what they were doing, because they did. They pulled that from Rome. They have no problem. It is cited. They have many things cited from from that uh, Roman structure. It rebuilt right here in America. It's part of the breakaway. So they took bits and pieces of a governing system 
from different kingdoms at work. And they use it. They use that for America. America's um, the brand new bait, right? The breakaway. It's not under a monarch. It's different. And then, so what happened was America ends up doing what? Bearing rule over all the earth for a while anyway. Right? For one, America did. But American want. You may have missed it. At the beginning of this, I asked you a question about, was it just a king? It was bigger than that. It was more. It was more. God appointed King Nebuchadnezzar. God established the head of gold. Babylon had rule over what? All of the earth. All these, all these kingdoms, now, it's using this word kingdoms in the translation. That is not the word with the original text, but kingdoms will, is sufficient. Each one of these empires had rule over all the earth. The first, and he talked of a second, but the third certainly did, that kingdom of brands, bear rule over all the earth. The fourth kingdom subdued the whole earth. The last kingdom to come in is the everlasting king. Oh, and also, in the fourth kingdom, we have something bad happening that cannot be skipped over. It's, it's, it says this. You ready? The worst thou saw them, the iron mixed with miry clay. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Uh-oh. Well, whatever they are, they are not men. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but shall not cleave one to another. To cleave is to embrace, to become intimate, marry. They won't marry. They're just going to mingle. Sounds like an experiment. Sounds like an abduction. I know it's you know, right there in people's faces. If, if something mingles its seed with man's seed, then it's a fulfillment of Scripture. Of what the Lord said. Correct? Because the Lord talked about this in a very specific way. We just don't always read those things, do we? Don't worry. We we will in this case, if the Lord helped me do so. So this fourth kingdom, this fourth kingdom partly strong, partly broken, but but this fourth kingdom is strong enough to have subdued everything else. Everything else. Hmm. All right. Now you know about those kingdoms, right? This is very important about those kingdoms. Here's why. There is another dream that was given. What I want you guys to see is this. The dominion and rule of these four kingdoms is over all the earth, not just one little tiny land. So when you're talking about Babylon, never think of Babylon as some corner place that only has rule over itself. No, God gave Babylon dominion over all the earth. Do you see that? Over all the earth. So God began a standard in the earth that we should certainly know. You cannot understand the beast in Revelation without understanding this. And I keep saying, the beast does not rise by itself. The beast is appointed to be the beast. By whom? Our Father. We're going to read something else. Now, everybody everybody has seen this, right? Everybody saw this. Everybody, everybody saw this. This is Daniel, just so you have a reference. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. This was 31 through, through 44. Last part is this, for as much as thou saw the stone cut out of the mountain without hands, and that break into pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, what is that? The entire statue. He said, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. So this is a prophecy. This is not some a guess. It's not a guess. It's not 
wishful thinking. It's not some rhetorical scheme. This is a prophecy from the living God. And of course, he said, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. It is sure. So let's establish this. King Nebuchadnezzar, being the head of gold, was put in the power by the living God. And dominion was given him over all the earth by the living God. Not by a bunch of people, not by the God next door, but by the living God. So these kingdoms of this earth, you're looking at them right here. All of them are encompassed in these kingdoms. These kingdoms are the existence of humanity in the earth. Let's call them empires. Call them empires, the real empires. These, these, this is very revealing. Now, go to Daniel chapter 7 with me, if you would. Daniel 7. And we're going to read something out of Daniel 7. Can we do that? Daniel, again, he has a vision of the four beasts. You guys have seen the four beasts, right? You guys have seen them. The way you've read about them, just in case you haven't, is in Daniel chapter 7. I'm going to read about the interpretation, Daniel's interpretation of these animals that he saw come up the, the uh, water, right? Here it is. Here it is. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Stay with me. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Then I will know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured and breaking to pieces, the more uh, breaking to pieces and stamped the residue with his feet and the ten horns. Sound for me, the ten horns, and the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even that horn that had the eyes, and the mouth that spake very great things, sound for me. He speaks, he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. He had a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Remember, sound for me, sounds just like Revelation 13 of the beast, of the beast. Okay. Same, 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 same thing here. Until he made war with the saints until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the king. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it into pieces. Uh-oh. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are the ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. That's a big hint. This, let me continue before I get too excited. Okay, this is Daniel 7, 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall work out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and a dividing of times. But the judgment shall sit. And they shall take away his dominion and consume and to destroy it until the end. And the kingdom and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Let me read that one more time. 
and the kingdom and the dominion. Listen, what kingdom? The fourth kingdom and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. That's why, you know, it keeps uttering something that the kingdoms of this world are going to be subdued by you. Let me continue. Let me continue. And all dominions shall serve and obey it. Hitherto is the end of them. As for me, day in my contradictions, much troubled me in my countenance, changed in me. I kept the matter of my heart. So what did you see here? He's still talking about, the, now we just read about the statue. And we emphasized elements in the fourth kingdom. In the fourth kingdom, this is very important. You have the iron mixed with the miry clay. And what is that? That's they will mingle themselves with the seed of men, but will not cleave one to another. So there's an element that is a non-human in the fourth kingdom, mingling with men, the same junk we face today, right? Now, let me continue. Because here it says, this kingdom is going to be diverse than everything else. Everything else. This kingdom is going to be diverse than everything else. The kingdom you live in right now. Right now. But something in this kingdom will begin to rise. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. It shall be diverse from all the kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it into pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first and shall subdue three kings. That's how the beast rises. So watch for three kingdoms to become one. But the judgment, it says, he, oh, and he's going to speak great words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. That's what he's going to do in Jerusalem. And they shall be given into his hand. They're going to be given into his hand. That means he's going to be able to do it. Nobody is going to stop him. They will be given into his hand. Who's going to, who's going to put that power in his hands to accomplish this? Your father. Satan does not empower himself. He can't do a thing unless God says, go and do it. Or you're allowed to do it. Don't forget that. Okay. He's going to do this in times, times, and a dividing times. But it says the judgment shall sit and shall take away his dominion and consume and destroy it until the end. Same thing Revelation says. So listen, we have this fourth kingdom, this mess we're in right now. Now, in this fourth kingdom, something is rising. In the fourth kingdom is what I want you to see. You had the first, King Nebuchadnezzar, the second, the third which was that brass kingdom that had dominion over all the earth, but you had the fourth, which was different than all the other ones, right? Now, within the fourth kingdom, something rises out of it, right? Something rises out of it. Folks, these kingdoms are the entirety of the earth. So we're not talking about, uh, you know, America and Europe. And, and no, we're not talking about the kingdom here, this fourth kingdom, is the entirety of the earth. That's why it says ten kings come out of it. Right? That's why it says more come. Hmm. And you live in that kingdom right now. You're certainly not in the room. You're not in the brass kingdom. That's not what you're in. You're in the fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom where things are coming out. Hmm? So now that you have that, here's the deal. These ten horns that come out of this kingdom, these are the ten kings, right? That will arise the fourth kingdom. Now, at the time of Revelation, this is important. When Revelation was written at that time, five kingdoms had already fallen. Egypt fell. Assyria 
fell Babylon, fell Persia, fell Greece, fell. Right. Stand it. At the time Revelation was written. Remember Revelation, it's this one is and one is yet to come. It was talking about the kings. One point this missed right, is that there are kings within the kings that will rise. And I think that somehow they've been lumped together. A lot of people say, you know, the Roman Empire was this, is this um, fourth kingdom. The problem with that is gives no room for what's happening right now. No room whatsoever, right? It's, it is, keeps everybody stuck at the one, you know, kingdom. And these kingdoms are decreed until the time being. So it's only four, it's only four, four kingdoms. Only four, so more than four. Let's continue, let's continue. So with these four kingdoms, and I bet guys, I know the arguments and, and you guys have you, Cyrus the Great and, and what was that other guy's name? Cambyses and Bardia or, or Smyrtius and Darius the Great. These are, these were the kings that rose during that time. I know about the kings, the kingship during that time of the book of Daniel, like the years of battle, the, the ones that were old. I know about the 10 who rose out of King Darius. I know about those 10, right? But what we're emphasizing is the fourth kingdom. That's what we're emphasizing, the fourth kingdom, the fourth. You guys got that? So again, just give you a recap, Daniel chapter two gives you the kingdom structure and God's appointing King Nebuchadnezzar dominion over all the earth, right? That these kingdoms have rule over all the earth, all the earth, just like now they have rule over. Let me ask you guys something right, right now. Does the world follow any common law? Does the world follow any common law? Yes or no? Anybody? Is there a common law to the entire world? Anybody? Mixler, wake up. You guys probably are probably getting disconnected. A lot of people are saying no. That's what a lot of people are saying. Right? That's okay for academia. Now let's throw academia out of the way. Throw politics out of the way. Politics out the rule of law, just politics. Get it out of the way. What do you see in this earth right now? Here's what you see. You see a standard of finances. That's what you see. You see a global change system. It doesn't matter if people are enemies or not. You see a global technological, right? Center of the entire earth. You, in fact, you see everything centered right now is what you see. You live right in the middle of it. Everybody uses currency. See, you're going to look at the, you got to take a step back from the hut, from your personal hut. And you have to take a step back. Take a step back and look at this thing one more time. Take a step back. Human beings use man-made money for food, for housing, for fuel, for dirt, for air, for everything. So man-made money, this money is accounted for and counted among all nations. This money is in one central system it is one central system it's already in one central system and everybody knows about everybody's currency but here's the thing you have to use man-made currency to buy or sell period you have to use man-made currency to get your food to live your life standard this is all over the earth all over the earth. Can I tell you guys something? In the middle of combat, when you're in the middle of combat, it is chaos. That's why you have to have external observers to let you know what's happening on the battlefield. If you do not have external observers, 
to let you know what's going on on the battlefield. You're going to die. Chances are, right? Because it's chaotic. You live in the middle of these systems. It is chaotic. You have to take a step back. You have to let go of the rhetoric. You have to let go of your indoctrination and what you're trained to believe. Let it go and look at it for what it is. See it for what it is. Finally, take a look at the tree and see the fruit of that tree. Who cares what name is on the fruit? Just see that it has fruit. And you're going to see a money system that the whole earth uses. And not only that, but a standard of that money system. The entire earth uses. Doesn't matter how much the dollar is over this currency or this currency over that currency. No. It's that everybody has to use money to buy or sell. I cannot go to someone with a goat. They say, let me get a couple of tires for that. I can't do that. We can't do that. So something, it's already standardized. Don't be tricked by this. See, a lot of people say, well, let's, you know, they're not using the exact same. Yeah, but you missed the entire change. The world went from trading goats and sheep and giraffe to currency. And everybody has currency. See, something has happened and people have not taken notice. You know, Jesus said the world is not going to know when the end comes. I know people, they read that Matthew 24. Jesus says, they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Let me emphasize, they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. They knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. See, you were born in the middle of something. Something you're so used to, you can't see it. You can't see it, and hardly anybody else can see it. What do you think that people would think before they had currency common in all nations? What do you think they would say right now? They would say, oh, my Lord, children, you're in trouble. They would tell you, you're right in the middle of it. But listen to me. Even the people who are born in the kingdom of the beast with the Antichrist walking around, you know what they're going to say? Oh, that stuff hasn't come yet. They've been saying that stuff is coming, and it still hasn't come yet. And these dodos are going to live in the time, right? They're going to be born. The beast is going to be down the street. They're going to have the mark on their heads at two months old or something, some weird thing. Weird stuff's going to be all over the place, right? But because they're born with the beast, they will not call him the beast. They won't call the systems of the earth some sort of an abomination. It's going to be home to them. It's going to be normal. The same thing has happened to us. We were born in an environment where things had been established. And we swear up and down. They're on their way and not here. Until you take a step back and begin to examine Everything, everything. And you'll see the chain. You'll see that you're in the middle of something. You'll have an answer to why your spirit is being urged to refine your life. Hmm? The scoffers are here, right? They are, they're, they're everywhere. What about the people that are born during the thousand-year reign? I guarantee those people are not going to think that time is so significant. Christ, people are going to rule and reign with Christ. Human beings are going to be born on the earth. You're going to be in a different form, those of you who stay faithful. Children will be born on the earth. And then when Satan is loosed after a thousand years, he's going to go out and deceive the four quarters of the earth. And they're going to try and fight God. So you know those people. Right? They're going to say, all this religious stuff is hoo-poo. And they're going to see angels. They're going to see supernatural. They're going to be on earth. 
with supernatural beings. They're going to see Christ. They're going to see angels. They're going to see all sorts of things, and they're going to be deceived. They're going to be deceived. I can almost see those people beholding miracles every single day. And when they are deceived, they're going to want even more than what they have. They're going to normalize their conditions after their own flesh. And they're going to say, ah, oh, this stuff has been like this for years. While Jesus is on the earth, they're going to say, this has been like this for years. And then they're going to be mustered together to fight against the living God. How can you muster people together to fight against the living God, if you don't sit there and downplay everything that's around you, that's supernatural. Hmm? And what I'm telling you is that the same thing is happening right now. You know what the problem is? You haven't seen a giant. You've not seen a troop of angels walk right in front of your face. You've not walked through any gates. That's the problem. You have no proof. And if you're looking for that, you've already messed up. Anybody who needs proof to believe has no internal confirmation in that they would follow God's truth right now. See, in the Bible it says many would become willfully ignorant of the truth. That means they would not want to know the truth. They want to know their version of the truth. They want their dream established. They want their future to come forward. Make you care less what the Lord decreed. They want it their way. That's why I will never, ever say, oh, yes, my way is just going to work out for everybody. No, it isn't. It is not. But I know one thing for sure. I know one thing for sure. I know that men live in conditions you would not be able to comprehend with your mind. You know that? I know that people on this TV that keep talking about the spiritual realm have no idea what they're talking about. I know that one too. And I'm not the only one. Lots of people. You know how these folks are saying spirits are energy. And energy never goes away. Who gave them that word? Where did they get that from? Why do they take things like it's law when it comes from mankind and the concepts of men? We are but babies, infants, and yet we're masters of the spiritual realm. I don't think so. It shows you the arrogance and foolishness of us. But let's not be so foolish as to deny the massive changes that have already taken place. Look at the weather. The weather is an example of that. How many people are threatened by the weather when it's not flooding or, or no tornado is in your neighborhood? Nobody's threatened by the weather. But if this same weather would have appeared 25 years ago, people would have been on their knees. Here's the problem, though. We get too used to conditions. We do. We get used to conditions. Just like I can imagine the rain drizzling in the time of Noah. And people see the rain and they're astonished for five minutes. And they say, well, let's, you know, let's just watch it. Then it rains harder. Well, that's okay. So get this piece of thing and we can keep the rain off our heads. The ground gets covered up. It's okay. Let's we'll just go to higher ground. No big deal. Let's get back to our party. It's the same thing they're doing. The only time they screamed and hollered out was when they put their foot out in the water and there was nothing underneath it. And they couldn't go up anymore. I can imagine that. I can imagine that. That the only time they ever cried out, oh, it's real, is when they were about to lose their lives. But when the, when the drizzle came, nothing. When the rain came, nothing. When the waters rose, nothing. When the water overtook them, something. Jesus says the same thing is going to happen again, that men will know nothing until everything overtakes them.
you guys sing? They're not going to admit to anything and tell it over the book of Revelation when normal people see the scales, right? The scales. They see those scales. And a lot of people say financial collapse. I saw something. I remember the first time I kind of shared what I saw. I was chastised. They said, that's a financial collapse. I said, they said, well, what do you see? I said, I see the establishment of finances for the whole world. They never had that before. Balances imply everything is weighed against a currency. Everything is weighed against a currency. The establishment of a currency standard. This one I saw. The first horse in Revelation, right? the one with the bow, no arrow, and he went forth to conquer, right? While everybody saw that, they said, yes, that's, that's the first Antichrist. I don't see that either. Well, what do you see? I said, well, the, the, the giveaway is actually the other horse. This horse has, he wants to go out and conquer. It's like a spirit that kings have. They think they should rule everything. Each king thinks they should rule everything. Just like each person thinks they're right. But every conclusion, it's a condition, a spirit that went out, cause it, cause it. Because he went out to the what? Who did he go out to? Who did he go out to? Causing nation to be against nation. That's when this nation believes that its standards should govern everything and not the other. It's a mindset. He had no arrow. He had a bow. That's posturing, right? He had a crown, but he had a bow, no arrow. He did not shoot. He wasn't shooting anything, but he had the weapons. He had the weapon with no, no arrow. So he had the tool. His, his posturing, right? He went forth to conquer. He went forth to conquer the same attitude in all these nations against each other. What about the one where it says, the, the one horse that took peace from the earth? Really? Like the earth has been peaceful all this time, and all of a sudden in the future, there's going to be no peace in the earth. There's no peace in the earth. There's no peace in the earth. Why would God release a spirit to take peace from the earth when there is no peace in the earth? Lord, have mercy. Right? So something wasn't, it just wasn't working. The people horse, when these horses rode. But a person can see, they can choose not to see. But the conditions of revelation we endure right now, people have a habit of trying to, and every day, I bet you every day I have a talk with someone, and this guy today said, well, you know, life is something else in it. And I was listening. I never said a word. Life is something else. And he started talking about life, and he started talking about, you know, you strive in life, you try, and to make this happen, and you try to make this happen, and you try to, you know, you just, he said, I guess you just, you take life, and you thank God for things, and you make the best of it. And I was thinking in my head, no, no. What is wrong with people? Make the best of it. What is wrong with people? So let me tell you where my mind is, because you guys may not know this right now. I don't think that way at all. By the way, I do not. To me, this is to me. I don't mean anything on anybody out there, but to me, that's foolish to make the best of it. It's foolish. That's foolish. Here's why. Only when you think of life without the judgment to come are you going to sit there and say, make the best of it. Because if you think of the judgment, then you know you're here for a purpose. And if you know you're here for a purpose, you might want to find it. And in your pursuit, you have no time for this Sodom and Gomorrah practice that's in the earth. And while you're doing, trying to look for, you know, 
your morale meter, the judgment is we will face the living God, right? So life does not just make the best of it because there's one sure thing about life. Your flesh is going to go into nothingness. That means you will depart this earth one way or the other. You will. You're leaving. You're going. You won't be here. And you're going to stand before the most high. People right now, they're chasing a paradox. Those who do not, who don't, who sit there and ignore, they, they do. They deny death. Life becomes pointless when we do that. When you deny death, you're not thinking about the, the fact that you're going to die. It is appointed to man once to die. Well, you're not thinking of it. Then you start acting like somehow you're going to be living for an eternity and you can do anything you want to do. Right? No. If we deny that we will be judged, life becomes nothing but a daily search for paradise. Isn't that what people do? They search for their own paradise. They're not they're not pursuing Christ. They're pursuing their own individual paradises. As for the parties and entertainment and all this, there, it's just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Just like that. What were they doing in Sodom and Gomorrah? They were fulfilling their own desires. Forget about the nakedness. Forget about the lewd acts and all that. They were fulfilling themselves on any and everything they could. And if you're not thinking about the judgment, if you're not thinking about the fact that you will depart this earth, you're going to do the exact same thing. But when you start thinking about this one thing, I've got to stand before the Lord. Why? Because he, because he asked me something. Well, what did the Lord ask us? All throughout life, your situations are talking to you. And you know what they're saying? Anybody? You know what your situation is saying? Your situation is saying, especially the bad ones, is this enough to get you to turn your back on the family? Like Beelzebub. You can call him what you want, Lucifer, the dragon. Is this enough to get you to turn from the family, the righteous family, the family you're called into, the family you were created to be a part of? This is the crucible. With every situation you go through, you're giving an answer, a true one, and it's beyond words. See, if God were to ask you my way of words, you would give an answer favorable. He's not asking you that. Your situations are talking to you. Everything that happens in your life is talking to you. And what is our answer in truth? We're giving a daily answer because every time we give up, you know what we're saying? Yep, this situation will cause me to fall away just like Satan. But isn't that love for a creator to give us that opportunity in truth to do that in the first place? Yes, it is. But once you come to that knowledge, how long will we take advantage of? Well, I'll tell you something, that time is going to run out. I pray that our answers become very sincere, that we do not bury our heads in the sand like a lot of people. And said, you know, this whole death thing, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to, just don't want to talk about it because you know what, guys, I'm not that person. If a person looks at me and says, I don't want to talk about anything dealing with death, well, you go somewhere else because you're not facing the truth. And I don't live in Disneyland. Death is an absolute for the body. One day, you're going to be called. You don't know when that is. Tomorrow is promised to not. People don't want to think of that. You know why? Because they're not working towards standing in front of Jesus. They're not thinking about that. You know what they're thinking about? How can I establish my paradise in the earth? How can I give that prayer so I can get everything that I want? That's what they're thinking about. 
all of us, we're going to stand before the most high. And the truth of everything we are is going to be displayed. And no one will have an excuse. No one. And that time is coming. So is it, is it evil or is it good that revelation comes? That all these things in revelation, you know what everybody wants to run away from? You know what I say? I say it's good. Because if God did not send those things, would we be serious enough to consider that we're going to stand before him? And why do we keep appointing ourselves another day? Don't tell me we don't do that because we do. We will lay down tonight with plans for tomorrow, not having done critical things. How long must we continue to do? The world is the king all around us. When you enjoy this world, you can get lost. Have you noticed that when things go wrong in your life, that's when you consider Christ. It's when you consider the Lord. Haven't you noticed that? When things go wrong, you get close to the most time. When things go wrong, you start finding out who you are. When things go right, you entertain yourselves. When things are flat, the complaints begin. Complaints, they keep going until things get far worse. And then you ask forgiveness for complaining in the first place. The Lord does that out of love. Because if he doesn't, if the Lord did not snap us out of our own delusions, so here's the question. Right? Here it is. Why do we keep going in that direction? I met a person who had so many questions about Christ, but all of them were about the same question. They wanted to know why all this stuff was happening in their lives. Why they couldn't do right. You know what my answer was? We end up doing everything we choose to do. God will never force us to do right. We must choose it. And unfortunately, in freedom, well, it's kind of tough to choose the right thing in freedom because you're so busy having fun. Maturity starts when pain begins. Haven't you noticed that? Maturity starts when pain begins. When you start having pains, you start to mature. That's the truth. We can't grow any other way. We can't. We cannot grow without pain. Do you guys know that? We can't. We can't. Can't do All we have to do is remember that. So that when you start going through something, you won't see it as going through something. You'll see it as a communication to you, an opportunity for growth, a time to see who you really are, a time to double check all the gauges of your spirit. Hmm? That's what it is. How many of you remember the worst pain you ever had? many you ready for this no one does you remember the circumstances around it but you cannot recall that pain you can't do it because if you did you'd be in pain right now isn't that wonderful so you can hurt you can remember you hurt become fearful of that hurt and try to avoid it for the rest of your lives but you're protected from the pain you go through who does that Scientists looked at that and they said it's impossible that we should be that way. Do you know? It's impossible. We shouldn't have a memory like that, something so intense that everything that really affects us would be cut off. Okay, I'll take a break. I'm going to take a break, but I'm not playing music or talking about emotions in the middle of this break. But you guys can take a break, but I'm not. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna do a little side thing here. I just have, I'm gonna just do a little side thing here. So right now we're gonna cue it. We're gonna take a break starting right now.
for everybody else I'm going to talk about it. Don't worry if you miss this, no big deal. Go get something to drink. Go do what you got to do. But I'm going to tell you guys something. You can believe this or not, but I found something out. In England, it's in England, I found something out. That emotions, emotions are more than what you think they are. First of all, you don't remember too well with emotions, you know. So you have to have some emotional contact with your memories. You do. You do. But also that emotions, the language of something else. So how would a human being have an offspring with the spirit? How would that ever happen? Can anybody answer that? How would a spirit, a person, who well, committed suicide in a hospital, dwell in the hospital that others would see this suicidal spirit in the hospital? How could that be? Are people hallucinating about the exact same face in the exact same place? Hmm? Or is something happening that's real? A lot of people say, well, it's a demon. I say more than that. See, the angels had offspring with human beings. The offspring were called Nephilim. According to the Book of Enoch, a Nephilim would live 500 years. Then it would die. Only the body. The spirit, because it was not sanctioned by the living God, had no placement in the heavens, nor in the earth, nor in hell itself. So they would roam the earth and be called evil spirits. And sure enough, you'd look at the book of Jude and you see something. You see something about people who function by something that is twice dead and plucked up by the roots. Men of old ordained to be ungodly men. Now, if you're ordained to be ungodly men, you were born to be ungodly. How can that be so? Because they have non-human spirits. Where did the non-human spirit come from? It is the offspring of man and spirit. So can that, if, if, if man can be the vessel, if man can be the vessel or humans can be the vessel of an Ephilim, can man give birth? To some evil spirit? Yes, sir. Emotions. Lots of experimentation took place with emotions. Lots of deadly experience. Deadly things that happened. But there were some curious things that took place. Let me give you one example. Something that's been recorded hundreds of times. You ready? You probably won't believe it. I only have a few minutes. There are people in the world over time that wanted to help somebody else. They really wanted to help them out. And in every case, they wanted to help them out spiritually. I mean, they had a strong desire to do it. Real genuine people. Well, there are hundreds of reports of people over the course of, we were talking many, many years, who were in one location sleeping dreaming about helping the person they wanted to help confronting dark spirits. But here's a twist. The people in the place where the person was they wanted to help always reported that that person, that person was rebuking a demon. Right? But that couldn't have happened because the person who wanted to help was miles away, living their own sleeping or something, but they wanted to help someone so bad that they simply manifested in the place in spiritual warfare against demonic entities or negative spirits for the sake of somebody else. Those are hundreds of records. It's even, you know what, they find those on CCTV a lot. Genuine people who want to help have been in 
two locations at once. And the curious thing is this, the people who wanted to help always say they had a dream that they were helping. And everything they mentioned in the dream was seen by others to actually take place. That's how the entry to this emotional thing began. The certain experiments had taken place. And they found something out about emotions. See, when you're in a bad mood, when you examine yourself, what happens when you're in a bad mood? Anybody? When you're in a bad mood, right? When your emotions are in a bad mood. It's almost like you run from a different power source. You also attract things. You call things. You position yourself in that same target space. When you're in a bad mood, you're operating on the same level as any other dark entity of that emotion. Of that emotion. For example, a spirit that's depressed in a hospital that people keep seeing, if you get around that spirit, you're going to be depressed. Just like that spirit is. Why? That spirit, it appears to be a consequence of a person giving in to depression. So much so that when that person passes, they have given life to a spirit that knows nothing but depression. And it may look like, they could look like the person who died. They're not the person. Because they always have all these spirits that people see that have been recorded, they don't have eyeballs. No eyes or dark holes, right? But if you get around these spirits, you get depressed. You get around that area, you're going to get depressed. It'll begin to interact with you emotionally. And if you give in to your own emo or emotions, period, you're giving in to something that's influenced you. Right. As it turns out, the test revealed that emotions do not begin within a person, but outside of a person. There's an external stimulant that happens before a person responds chemically with an emotional subset. Now, that makes no sense, does it? Which means all your emotions that you have are external trigger something outside of you is inducing those emotions now you you can act on them or not have you ever had a thought in your head that would make you nervous but then the phone rang and it interrupted your thought now if you had continued you would have been nervous but you did not you got the phone call and you shut the whole thing down so you just instantly cut that off right you, you ever do that before? You had no time to entertain that idea that was going to change your emotional, you know, set or something like that. You ever walk into somebody's house and all of a sudden your emotions, they, they just flip on you. Hmm? They change. You ever walk into a store and you pass someone and your emotions change? You ever do that? Hmm. Things like that take place. So, if you said no to all negative emotions, then indeed you would have a notable change in your life. So then if you give in to negative emotions, you're under the influence of something already. And have you noticed that when you have these negative emotions, that's when you have the most questions about the authenticity of the living God and Christ and his word. Have you noticed that? In other words, you become standoffish to the word of God. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed? I wish more people would. Because they would say no to emotions. Even some of the, some of the good emotions for silly reasons. I wish that people were sober and would take command of what they entertain, that would be a good thing. 
Hmm? A good thing. A freeing thing. Many would be free in that. Too many are slaves to their feelings. No wonder Jesus said, take to your thoughts. Cast down imaginations, those things that would exalt themselves above the living. No wonder he said the carnal mind is against God, and the carnal mind is your natural mind. Okay, back to Revelation. Sometimes you have thoughts like, so I just took this break to exercise and thought, as you see, those things happen. All right, back to the beasts again. So with these beasts so far, right? So far, we have talked about the dragon. We have looked at the structure of the first beast. The first beast. We see that the first beast is a collection of kingdoms, right? What people call kingdoms, right? We know this beast, this first beast, is more an empire than anything else. And we know that in Revelation 13, a second beast pops up. So we have the dragon, and we have the first beast, which is more an empire than anything else. We might, may as well say the fourth kingdom, right? fourth kingdom, which is the part of the beast we're dealing with. But from this fourth kingdom, we know that something comes out of it. Correct? Something was this terrible comes. Three. So that's the dragon, the first beast, and the second beast. But nobody ever talked about Revelation with the dragon, the first beast, and the second beast. What did they say? What did they say? What have you guys heard? The three major things of Revelation. Antichrist. What else? False prophet. Is the other one. False prophet, the Antichrist, was the other one that they always say. They always say. You guys see it. Antichrist, beast, false prophet, right? That's what you hear. Or you hear the dragon, right? The dragon, the beast. Or the dragon, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. You always hear of them that way. So who's the false? What is the false prophet? Where does he come into play? Who is this false prophet? You ready? This might mess up your mind. You ready? The false prophet is the second beast, which just so happens to be the Antichrist. How in the movies they show you the Antichrist with a false prophet. I can't buy that one. Can't buy that. Okay? The Antichrist is the false prophet. I don't, I don't follow these too well. Sorry about that, guys. Not, not really spoiled by that. Let, let me go ahead and read something to you so that you guys understand what I'm talking about. Can I do that? Can I do that? Can I read this to you? I'm going to read something to you. I want everybody to turn real quick to Revelation 16. Can you do that? I'm going to read Revelation 16, 13. Now I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So these three unclean spirits have been working in who? The dragon, out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. Dragon, beast, false prophet, right? Sounds pretty good, right? Let's go back to Revelation 13. Revelation 13, John saw a beast. He saw a beast, right? In, in Revelation 12, he saw, he saw a, um, a beast. But look here, Revelation 13 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. That's the first beast, having seven heads, ten horns, and, and ten crowns. And upon his heads the names of blasphemy. That's the first beast. 
So where's the second beast at? Oh, here it comes. Revelation 13, 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. The two horns like a lamb is a dead giveaway, false prophet. Wait a minute. Let's find out who this guy is. He has two horns like a lamb. It says, but two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth, and them that dwell therein, to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven inside of all men. Wait a minute, this is the one who calls this fire to come down from heaven in view of all men. Oh, here he goes. And he deceives them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles, which he had power to do in sight of the beast, saying unto them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. So let me tell you what's going on so far. So this first beast was given his power seeing great authority by Satan. The first beast we just we just read about in the book of Daniel. It is the established and ruling kingdom in the earth. And out of the fourth kingdom of that whole conundrum, which we live in right now, out of the fourth kingdom, something comes not out of the sea. Now yesterday we read that the sea were the many peoples, nations, tongues, and languages. Right? We also read that the woman sitteth right in the middle of these guys. Right? As we read yesterday. So we established the first beast. The first beast is a collection of nations with kings appointed to those nations. But something is coming up from in between all these nations. Something. Something that has two horns like a lamb, but he speaks as a dragon. Now, to have draconian speech or speech, speak as a dragon, that means you have legalistic speech or geopolitical speech, right? Satan has a speech of men, of the earth, of rule. So Babylon is that King Nebuchadnezzar is that head of gold, the standard for all things, that had dominion over all the earth. The kingdoms we read about in the book of Daniel have dominion over all the earth. The beast has dominion over all the earth so that we know that these folks, these kings that are coming are highly political. We know that. We know that. And the world loves the beast and the world loves these folks. Anyway, let's continue. So this beast, this first one, was given a big mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. He wore out the saints of the Most High. Power was given unto him to wear out the saints of the Most High, to overcome them for a season. But then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, another beast comes up under the earth. He has two horns like a lamb. That implies a faith figure. He has two horns like a lamb, and he speaks a dragon. He did not come from the people. No, he did not come from the people. He came up out of the earth. What's in the earth? What is always described as being in the earth? The bottomless pit. He has two horns like a lamb, and he speak as a dragon. To speak as a dragon. But they have a governor's mouth, they say. Have a governor's mouth. Let's continue. Listen, he exercises all the power of the first beast. Just like an appointed king would exercise all the powers of that king. Right? Just like King Nebuchadnezzar exercised all the powers of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar was the power. Come on now, we have the models right here in the Bible. We have the dirt trail, don't and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth inside of all men. He deceives those that dwell on earth by means of those miracles. And he says unto the world, make an image to the first beast, who had the deadly wound by a sword and did live. That means one of the heads of the beast were, as it were, wounded to it was killed, but it came back to life. Dun dun it's like a nation was totally messed. See, we have wars happening right now. So one of the nations, 
right? It's going to look like it's messed up, but it's going to come back from the dead. Now, I used to think, oh, that's an empire coming back from the dead, right? That's what I'm, but then when I did the structures of the beast, according to the book of Daniel, I had to toss that. I can't go by that. I had to go by the word of God. Anyway, and I should have went with that in the first place. That was my academic mind that got in the way. Yes, I'm telling you right now, my academic mind will stifle the spiritual word of God. So no academia. When it comes to spiritual insight to the word of God, I cannot use academia. I can't use that at all. It has always messed me up. I have to seek the Lord for the answer. I do. I don't want to change. I really don't want to change any views. I want the right answer from the Lord the first time. I do not want what's popular among men or what's easy to, to, for men to see or to connect the dots in a way that everybody understands. No, I want the truth, right? And it says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So this second beast is the one that, that tells the world, make an image to the beast, and it gives light to that image. Right? And anybody who does not worship the first beast, that image kills. Now listen to this. He calls us all, both small, great, rich, uh, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand of the foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here's, here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of, of a man, and his number six hundred three score and six. The important part here is we have the dragon, we have the first beast, we have the second beast, and we don't have anything else. But Daniel tells us who the second beast is. He does. So does Revelation. You know what the problem is? The problem is it's almost like people don't want to read all these scriptures together. We just talked about the false prophet in Revelation, Revelation uh, 16, 13. We just saw that word false, the uh, false prophet, didn't we? So who's the false prophet? The Antichrist. Why is he a false prophet? Because he's the one. He is the one that convinces the world that's doing all these false miracles. Right? Now, listen, what, what would be a lying sign? What would that be? What's a lying sign in one? One that's not authored by the living God. A manipulation of the environment. God commands his in Satan can never do that. Satan can never command the environment. God does. God commands it. Man has tried his best to try and command the environment. You wouldn't believe how they have miserably failed. You wouldn't believe it. They have miserably failed. Right? Believe me, they have failed. The weather, you, I don't think people understand the weather's not, the weather is a powerful, powerful system. Do you not know, it's just like the magnetosphere, right? Everybody looks at the magnetosphere and they're like, oh, you know, it's a little deal around the planet. No, it isn't. Do you know how huge the magnetosphere is? Do you guys know how big it is? Right there at the bow shot is a compressed place on the magnetosphere that's pushed back from the solar winds. It is compressed a great deal and is still 10 Earth, Earth away from the surface of the Earth. Ten of them in the, in the, of course, nothing opposes. Then you see the real deal. The forces involved enormous, enormous. So, are you guys starting to see this? You starting to see? It? Oh, oh, you guys starting to see it? See a lot of people never saw. It. You never saw this before, honestly. It's something very simple, right? It's, it's simple to say. It's trivial. It's trivial. But how many never saw this before? How many didn't put this together? And it's almost like um, it's some some. It's almost like something purposely confuses the simplicity of how the dragon, the beast, and the second beast are put together, how they interact, how they're not one and the same, 
but that they do coexist, right? how they work together, how they came. It is not like the movies, is it? It's not some person in a robe promoting, right, the Antichrist. That's not what's happening. The false prophet is the Antichrist. And that they, but, 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 there is a book that has it like the movies you see, and it's of a certain type of faith. And it's not Catholicism, it's something else. And if you see that, then you'll understand why they do it that way. Because they represent something that uh, they won't openly say. Now you know what to look for. And you'll have your reason. And I can assure you that people have been trying to get things over on you all for a long time. And they represent different types of faith, not Christianity. And people are buying it hook, line, and sinker, and they have made things look like they're... Listen to me, please. Listen to me. It doesn't matter if it's me, whoever it is. Get your truth from the source of truth. Do not get your truth from me. Get it from the living God. I can compliment the truth the Lord gives you. Do not get your truth from me. Don't do that. That is dangerous. Do not hinge your salvation on some man's word. You get it from the Messiah. Please, get it from Christ Jesus. Please. That way, if something ever happens to my head, you can say, hey, Mike, you've lost it. The word says right here the opposite of what you just said. And I'll say, okay, let me come back home. Thank you. Right? But if, you, if, 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 if you're not doing that, and I start to fall off a cliff, you're going to go right behind me. You're not helping me. You're just falling with me. That's not going to help me. Yeah, that works. See, one day I may have to follow you. You know what the Lord says? The Lord has appointed times and seasons in which people are favored. Different people are favored. There's always a time of humility coming, especially for those who are of age, time when real humility. If one have it, need it. And if, in fact, they have that true humility, they will yield almost instantly. Ooh. That means time will come when you all my greatest necessity. I hope you're consistent that when that day comes, you will be great help. Know that when men follow men, both fall into a ditch. You know what they used to call men following men back in the day? The blind leading the blind. That was a common phrase in the Middle East. Right there in Jerusalem. Among the Hebrews, actually. That when men follow men, and when they don't follow the voice of God, but when they follow men, that is the blind leading the blind. That's what it is. Well, now let me see. Let me let me look here. Let me see. Somebody said, Mike, I'm pressing it because I still listen to you know, you hear from the Lord. Well, let me tell you, let me share something with you guys real quick. Just so you understand this. I don't do what I'm doing right now. I don't do that. Just beg you and sit up and talk to people about subjects. I don't do that. Just don't do that. I don't do that. I don't do that. But when I do share, you should know many years I do not share what somebody else shared. I share with you all what the Lord has given me. What the Lord has given me is almost always controversial. 
it didn't come from me because if it came from me, it would kill all of you. If it came from me, it'd be terrible advice. When the Lord gives me something, it burns. I'll put it that way. It just burns. It burns. That's why COT started coming about the way it is, because it burns. It burns. And then I'm plagued with dreams about the same thing. Like the times that you're in right now. People are going to be caught off guard. I'm telling you guys right now, people, and it's heartbreaking. It, it is heartbreaking. People will be walking, doing their business, doing whatever. And I'm telling you, it's like meteorites or something, are going to knock the souls out of people's bodies. And those things are going to take over their bodies. But the souls of those people are going to descend into Sheol because they would go back. Listen, they would not go wholeheartedly to the Lord. They wouldn't do it. They would always go back to fix their bridge. Just in case the Lord thing did not work out, they had something on the back burner. The back burner is going to burn people. If you don't go all the way or without anything on the back burner, if you've got some backup plan you've already messed up, you're not going forward in faith. The only way to go forward in faith is to not have a backup plan. You can only go forward in faith with full commitment. Half commitment is no commitment at all. And a time will come and it's going to be hot outside. It'll be summer. It'll be an unassuming time, a break from the north. And on a clear day, a horrible thing will happen. And it will happen and people won't even make noise, but souls will be lost and they'll never come. And those folks who are knocked out of their bodies will not have a last word with those they love. These will be indecisive people who cannot make up their minds, who will not make up their minds, who were given a lifetime to make a decision and they refused to do it. I saw that. 24 plus times. And it was heartbreaking every single time. And it disturbs me to this very day. And every single day, I pray to the Most High. I do not want to be caught off guard. Because in those series of dreams, I was put in the people who kept going back to get things. Some would get medicine. Some would check on their money. Some were doing this and that. But they would not commit fully to the Lord. They wouldn't do it. For their whole lives, they would not do it. They would always have an excuse, a hang-up, something they would go back and do, and they wouldn't commit. All they had to do was commit, and they would have had their breakthrough to stay. You need a breakthrough to stay. You can't stay unless you have a breakthrough. Do you know everybody there who stayed had a breakthrough? That's why they stayed, because they committed because they didn't have something on the back burner just in case the faith thing didn't work out. Faith works by full commitment or not. There is no in-between. That's a delusion. All the while a person is making up their mind, they're actually saying no. It's better not to know at all than to not make up your mind. Now, if you guys saw that, and if you had no choice but to understand and know through your very bones that that was going to take place. Would you toy around with the word of God? Would you play around with anybody's lives? I don't think you would. You would relive that disastrous moment every single day of your life, knowing it's coming. And every day of your life, you would see people become just what you saw in the dream. And that's how you would be. Everywhere you look, you'd see the same thing. The progressive state of time closer to that event. And you would understand that your time is running out.
And when it says microphone, hard to connect with brothers in my Bible study group, we see things different. I'll tell you something. God did not put us here to convince anybody. But we can set a standard and represent the best we can. You do that in honesty. You're going to go, everybody's not, everybody here on this earth is not going to the kingdom. They're not. The wheat are going to the kingdom if they choose to. Many are called, few are chosen. Still, some will fall away from the faith. Once you have that gospel, offer it sincere, with all patience, with humility and meekness, with everything you need that a person will truly be able to hear it. It's up to them to receive it and listen to me. A person must accept the gospel by way of freedom. They cannot be forced or it's not real. When you force a child to behave, you don't know what that child is until you let them go free. And then you find out they could, they're a bad child, right? The only way you find that out is when you leave them by themselves. Correct? You'll never know truly what a child is when an authoritative figure is in the room, when that authoritative figure leaves, and they have to leave for longer than a minute. Then you find out who the children are. When a teacher leaves a classroom, the first three minutes, nobody's doing anything. In the fifth minute, kids are standing up, spit wands are flying and everything else. The seventh minute, the teacher is about to come back to the room and, and the teacher thinks, wait, I mean, I mean, wait 10 more minutes. Why? Because in 10 more minutes, the kids will not even think of the teacher and they'll surely be doing the things that are truly inside their heart. After a duration of time, the teacher comes back, looks in the window, and she can see every child in their true state. Now, some children, are sitting there taking abuses and they hate that the authoritative figure has left in the first place. Why? Because they don't like doing the rebellious things the other kids are doing. And so they're sitting at their desk with their heads down. Good children. What are the bad kids doing? They're the ones throwing spit wads at everybody else, starting fights in the corners. They're caught in the middle of the act. They're caught in their own freedom. Everybody is caught in their own freedom. That's why a teacher that wants to know, they, if they really want to know who the class is, you have to leave it for a duration of time. When they come back, they truly see the children for who they are. Then they'll know they have this. You'll never know who's in the class when the authoritative figure is in the room. Boy, don't we face a situation like that. The authoritative figure has left earth. And what do you see? And gone a long time. And what do you hear? Oh, well, the teacher's not coming back. Let's do everything we can do. But some of us, some here, don't like the, that the authoritative figure left. They cling to his ways with everything they can. And the truth is they want him to come want him to come back because they like the new ways. They like the freedom of jumping up and down on everything. They like throwing spit wads at people and everything else. And guess what? The teacher's coming and nobody cares. Save those that are looking for the teacher to return. We'll be back in a few minutes right here. See it. Testing one. There we are. You guys didn't let me know I was talking too loud. I think I destroyed the battery. Okay. Where are we at? Oh, somebody had a pretty good statement. Someone said they didn't know what was wrong. And it's a, it's a, it's a place we can find ourselves in. Every has been in this place. When you are in one of those pursuits, and you're examining yourself and you're looking inwardly, outwardly, all around, and you don't know what's happening, right? 
what the what the hangups are. Anybody ever had a situation or a moment in time that was of such a degree that you could not open your Bible? Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever have one of those moments, times, a season where you couldn't really pray? Anybody? Of course we have. So let me tell you this. I want you to think about something, right? To be honest with yourself is to realize a few things. Number one, we do not like loss of control. When you give your life to the Lord, something you can't see, something you know, but something you can't see, and you have issues and circumstances that are not handled. That's not really controlling everything, right? That's not, that's not, there's no security in that. One of the hardest things you'll ever do in life is to go forward with no security. That is scary. It's very scary. It is, in fact, walking away from Egypt to a degree into an unknown place with unknown circumstances, with an unknown future. And that's normally what's not contemplated. See, when you accept Christ as your personal Savior, when you accept him, when you accept his sacrifice upon your life, right, is how you accept the sacrifice. Without repentance, there is no acceptance of that sacrifice, of the death of Christ. Do you all see that? In other words, only if a person is going to repent can they accept the Messiah. You can't accept a sacrifice if you're not going to allow that sacrifice to be a sacrifice. And so sometimes people have accepted Christ, but they did not think about repentance, right? And so what they end up doing is trying to fix everything. We can't fix anything. We, we can't do that. And sometimes you get stuck. You get stuck trying all of what's been well, that doesn't work either. Somebody says, what is repentance? Repentance is when you turn from sin. Now, turning from sin is not just, you know, turn to the left or right. That's not what that is. Let's say, for example, I have a sin like I like. Say to me, a sin would be, I don't know, say I like going to um, horse races. Right? That's a sin, horse races. And I've lost my house and shirt and everything else, but I'm still getting money somehow to go to horse races. All of a sudden, I see that's wrong, right? I see it's wrong. I don't want to do it anymore. Do I have a repentant heart? Nope, not yet. To see something is wrong and still do it is not repenting, right? That's not even to have a repenting heart. So I keep gambling and everything else, and then all of a sudden, I see it's tore up my family, grown relationships, but most of all, it's hurt other people. And when I find out it's hurt other people, and I don't like to hurt other people, but, the, but going to the horse races and gambling has hurt other people, I get upset with it. I get sick of it. Oh, I have a repentant heart because I'm sick of that sinful thing. And in that moment, I turn my back on it. And I say within myself, I'll never do that again. Never. Now at that moment, when I've realized what it did, when I've really turned my back on it, when nothing can make me do it again, I have a repentant heart. Now that repentance can only be fulfilled one way, and that's with Christ. We can turn away from something, but we still have the stuff from it, right? Christ takes all the stigma and everything else away as though it never was. I'll never go back to it. That's repenting. Repenting is when you never go back and do it again. That's what repenting is, turning away from sin. That's what that is. See that?
to ask forgiveness and to do it again is not repenting. Repenting is when you're done with it. Repenting, you're done with it. Do you see that? That's what repenting is. In a lot of cases, this is not explained. It's not. Because there are many things we have gotten sick of. And we have absolutely turned away from it. Hmm? Absolutely. The minute says, what is sin? The Lord says, in the Bible, sin is explained very well. Right? First of all, what God calls right is righteousness. Remember that. So you have to search the Lord for his way. Like he told Israel, you have to learn to do right. You have to learn to do right. How are they going to learn to do right? By inquiring of him. Your example is not with flesh. It's not in the world. It's in the Lord. It's bound in the Lord. Right? That's the first thing. So you have to have an example of what is righteousness. Secondly, the Lord said, if something is wrong to you, then to you it's a sin. Do not do it. Do not do it. You know when you have a, a bad conscience about doing something? Then to you it is forbidden for you to do it. For you. That's very important. And yes, that means one person can have zero conviction behind something. But you can. And in the Bible it says to you, you're not to do that thing that you have that conviction for. You're not to do it. Right? The apostles, they ate um, Paul. He ate pork, pig, and everything else. But to John, that was a no-no. John couldn't do it then. Correct. But all things permissible. That's why he said, it's not what goes in a man that defiles him of what came out in the proper context. He was talking about certain instructions and what they were, what they were raised up to do. Of course, Paul went to the Gentiles, ministered to them. And John was with the Jews and folks like that. So they had two different callings to a degree. They were going to be exposed to different things. But to John, he couldn't partake of certain things. So to him, he couldn't. But Paul could partake of anything. It was no big deal. Right. So we know it's within us. So there's what the Lord calls unrighteousness. And there are things we have conviction of. For example, if, if, if you know how people say, well, I'm going to tell you this. I don't care if it hurts you or not. I don't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. Because if a person does not receive love, then it's not love. And I can always do better. So to me, it's wrong to be outspoken and foolish indeed to be outspoken. It's right for me to be patient. So I'm not going to be the outspoken one. You know, I'm very patient when it comes to people. Anyway, that's where we are. But remember that about repentance. And when you do repent, the Lord is just to forgive. And whatever you did, whatever you turned away from, is wiped away. It's gone. It's gone. It's absolutely gone. Right? The second thing is this. Many people pursue with the Lord for what? So they can get something. They want something fixed, repairs, you know, something like that. Wrong motive. It's the wrong motive. That's not even the right. That, that doesn't even go in the category. In a lot of cases, uh, and, and certain people, when you do that to certain people, it makes, it doesn't bode, right? it doesn't. Because if, if a person does not get what they're going after, they're going to be discouraged. They will. And if the foundation of their relationship with Christ is to get something out of him, to, to repair something that no one can guarantee is going to be repaired or given or granted or something of that nature, then that person is going to be misdirected from the beginning. The client takes a family, a group, a body, so the whole world can be administered. 
the entirety of the word takes all of us. One of us, not two of us, all of us. Takes all of us. It really does take all of us. But here's my advice. Don't search for what is wrong. If you do that, you're going to be hunting for things that are wrong all of your life. Search for righteousness and understand that everything is wrong. You're in a wrong world. This world is all upside down, right? But God is calling us out of those things into the marvelous light. That's called a process. And in that process, he is growing us. We're not growing ourselves. Only he knows how to do it. We don't know how to do it. If we knew how to do it, we would not need a savior. We certainly would need a Holy Spirit. We don't know how to do it. So realize that, but of course, we don't know how to do it. So look to the Lord. To the Lord. And as far as instruction and finding out what he calls right, that's in the word of God. That's what we find out from that. Anyway, that's where that is. Back to the beasties. You guys see this about the first the dragon, the first beast, and the second beast, right? Someone is asking about Brother Like is Satan falling like lightning this month, February 21st. Well, you may not like my answer, but here it is. I'll give it to you anyway. When Christ, in the Revelation study, as I said before, when Christ ascended to the right hand of the Father, Satan fell like lightning long before that happened. When Christ ascended to the right hand of the Father, Satan could not accuse anybody anymore because Christ is a living sacrifice right now. He has not come back yet. So he's still a sacrifice. Satan can't accuse anybody where Christ sits at the right hand of the Father standing ready to forgive. The power of forgiveness is given to Christ. So in Revelation, when it says Satan and his angels were cast down into the earth, you know what I believe? They're here already. Side, there are too many things mankind as a whole has not seen. If they saw it, they would 1,000% believe that fallen angels are here on this earth and Satan is with them. But they have not seen it. But they will. They will. No one can accuse you to the Father. No one. No one. Satan has no placement in the heavens like in the book of Job. When Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father, Satan lost his place in the heavens who accused them before our God day and night. He's in the earth with his fallen already here he did not fall he's fallen a long time ago when christ beheld him fall that's why he was in the garden he had already fallen that's why he was lying in the garden that's why he deceived in the garden he was already in a fallen state but in revelation it specifically says he was cast into the earth and the angels were cast out with him and he pursued the remnant of the woman who had that child, which was called up to God, which are believers who keep the commandments of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ. That is you. He's after you. That's why Jesus told us about the adversary and his pursuit of us, which is why we have the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Here we are. So tonight, anyway, you, we have the general components of the beast, the dragon, the first beast, and the second beast. The second beast, as it turns out, is the Antichrist and the false prophet. The first beast we read about in the book of Daniel. Also, the second beast is, is um, the complicated thing. 
But nevertheless, it is there in the structure of it. Book of Daniel and Revelation and Revelation uh, 17. Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. And it speaks about him. Daniel 11 is what he does. The battle plan is laid out in Daniel 11. Daniel 12 is the ending of the matter. The ant causes the world to make an image to the first beast who had the deadly wound by a sword and didn't live. That is the beast that came from the land that had two horns like as big as a dragon. He's the one that does the false miracles, called and fire to come down from heaven and sight of all men. And he is the one that institutes the mark, the same one. And all that's in Revelation 13. First, second beast, Revelation 13, dragon, Revelation 12. Good descriptions of them. The, now, this system you're dealing with, the man who will govern this entire system, has not yet come. In the Bible, he will be revealed to all of us. All of us will know. The mark of all marks of time will be when he sets up the abomination of desolation. And so then that era will begin. You can also read that in the book of Daniel chapter 11 when he sets up the abomination of desolation, of which Christ was referring to. Or the writer was referring to, and Jesus spoke about. It. So when that happens, Jerusalem is going to be under siege. Forty-eight two months. The Antichrist, right? The world is going to worship the beast first, and the dragon. So they're going to like this stuff. They're going to be loyal to it. I mean, very loyal, patriotic to it. Very patriotic. But I give you a warning: those born at the time of these elements will not see those. It's going to be normal to them. We are one of the generations born right smack dab in the middle of one of those elements, I do believe. And people keep saying things are coming. Unfortunately, they're ignoring what's already among them. On occasion, certain people get the opportunity to see what's among them. Thank God for those people who seen things that you have not, because you probably don't want to see them. Remember, I'll, 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 I'll say this, that person that has a question about Apollo, is he coming from Saturn? Apollo's here. Do you know that? Apollo is here. Something is here, and it's not fake, and it's not made up, and it's not somebody's imagination. And there is no human being on earth that can outpower it. They forget that. It's right here on this earth. Parts of it are already worshipped. Apollo is already worshipped on the earth. He's in three different forms distributed all over the earth. His capital is most notable. And people love, they love Apollyon already. And that's only his representation when the cage is actually opened. But of course, they had to get people used to idols first. The whole bedazzling thing they had to get people used to. Me? When the Lord said, when, when the Lord said, do not make himself any engraven image or any likeness of anything above the earth and the earth or beneath the earth, I, the Lord thy God, I'm a jealous God, visiting the iniquities among the fathers and the sons' children. Or in third, fourth generation of them that hate me, showing mercy to the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. When he said that, that means no idols, no engraven images. But the earth is full of engraven images. And people worship things. They have no idea what they are. But they feel a punk to them. Right? You guys have a natural loyalty, all of us do, to the countries that we belong in for the most part. Is that we are patriotic. The problem is we don't know what's in. We don't know what's within these lands. We don't. We don't. We don't. We don't. 
We don't. But you will find this year that they lied big time about history. There will be many confessions that come out this year. I mean, confessions of confessions begin this year. And the fall of falls begins this year. They're underway right now. And it is an orchestrated dealing. And it's going to upset some folks. But it's coming anyway. People are in high worship of entities. The Lord warned us, worship the Lord thy God only, and in him we are to trust. But we can't do that. We keep being sidetracked. We keep worshiping things made with hands. We keep doing it. We give it a name and we go forward with it. Now that things are highly perverted, those things are covered also. But here's the difference. The immoral people are not going to care. If, if something is living for the representation of what people are enthusiastic behind, they're just going to love it even more. They're prime. People are prime to accept some sort of deity. The Lord gave us that one. He told us. He asked us, don't do it. Don't do it. But we did so anyway. Now we're in the days when things are uncovered, when people are going to really see what they've been worshipping, what they've been loyal to, and who's in representation of those things. Washington, D.C., strongest one. The other ones, plural, placed flat in trees. But it's a different discussion. Listen, I'm going to say thank God for you guys joining me tonight. I'll be talking to you guys tomorrow night. As we continue with our talks in Revelation, I will update the site with a small description of our topics as we go forward. God bless each of you. I look forward to talking with you guys tomorrow. And we're going to have some questions tomorrow also. A lot of questions tomorrow. So bring your questions to the table, please. Do that. I appreciate you guys fellowshipping with each other, helping each other out. That's pretty awesome. You guys keep the questions going. Keep those sincere questions going. Don't stop those. I love questions. I do. Most important, I like to help in any area I can help in. Okay. Somebody says, no midnight hour. No, not tonight. I, I think I'm going to rest one more night before I give it to you. Uh, put it back in first gear right now. My lowest gear ever. No, the other night I was in my lowest gear ever. I think I'm going to be on time. Somebody says, Michael and Barack, no, they're done for. They're, never, they're not coming back. They're finished. Anyway. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Let's keep all of you. Hey, listen, I'll say it again. If you're going to vote for a guy, pray for the guy. Do that. These folks who are candidates, who would dare go against anything, they need your prayers. Do, do any, does, does, does anybody truly know who they are? the Lord does? We don't, right? But you can be a blessing. And you can change. You can change. You can change many things by what you put your heart toward because you belong to Christ. Do you know that? Hope you know that. I hope that you know. You will be the determining factor in a great many things in this world. The USA, we know we have an election year. If you're praying for the one you're voting for, if you vote, you're praying for the one you're voting for. You're involving your father in heaven, and I'm telling you, change will come. You don't like the way things are going? Then pray. Pray. That's what you do. Me, I'm praying for the father's solution. I am. I'm praying for his solution always. Just pray. 
just God bless you all. I'm going to see you next time right here at COT. God bless.